Fire kills whites, you told me. What breathes fire? Hey YouTubers, congratulations for surviving Comic-Con. Now we gotta freak out about episode two. Just careful for spoilers if you haven't seen it yet. I was surprised by how many times they referenced Aegon's conquest and Robert's rebellion. They keep doing that in each of the episodes, so it's probably going to keep happening too, where they liken events that are happening in present day. This very same thing played out before. But if you're new to the channel, I'm doing Game of Thrones videos all season. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. And there is a giveaway I'll explain at the end of the video. But starting with number 10, Stormborn. So like they actually narrated in the early part of the episode, Daenerys was born during the end of Robert's Rebellion while a great storm was raging over Dragonstone, the most depressing sight ever. You come to your ancestral home and it's the exact opposite weather from a sunny marine. But the interesting thing is it goes beyond that. There are a lot more parallels because during the night of that storm of her birth, the Targaryen fleet was being smashed in the Eastern Sea. So just like at the end of this episode, the Greyjoy fleet that they had got smashed by Euron's fleet. So it's almost an exact repeat of the events of that night. But I love how Daenerys starts to turn on her small council a little bit. It's just her way of letting them know that she has her eyes on them. She doesn't completely trust them, even though she believes that they'll be loyal. I'll burn you alive otherwise. I love the nice hat tip for the Mad King burning Rickard Stark, which they later referred to during the Jon Snow storyline. Remember what happened when our grandfather went to meet the Targaryen King? They're still referring to Jon Snow as a Stark because they don't know his heritage yet. And we'll talk about this again in a second. But he also said that Sansa's the only Stark in Winterfell. Like, we know Bran's going to show up eventually, too. So there was a lot of eye-winking in this episode for things that we know they're setting up, but that the characters don't know yet. The Queen of Thorns also had a really nice moment with Daenerys where she's like, you're not a sheep like the rest of the lords of Westeros are you. You're a dragon, so maybe you don't always listen to Tyrion. So I think what she's just trying to tell Daenerys is not to use too much restraint. Marjorie was a wonderful person, and now she's a pile of ashes. So we'll see what happens when they actually go up against the Lannister army. I cannot wait to see what Tyrion does when they're facing Jaime in open battle, because we haven't got to that yet. But number nine, Melisandre shows up speaking High Valyrian, explaining the prophecy of the prince who was promised. And I love Missandei's tip. Actually, you know, it's a gender neutral prophecy, which theory crafters, like I've said on my channel, pretty much anybody who's ever put a Game of Thrones prince who was promised theory on the internet has pointed out the fact that it could be a man, could be a woman based on the way the prophecy should be interpreted, the way High Valyrian intends it to be. But she's just explaining to Daenerys who Jon Snow is, why he's so important. Let him come and tell you what he's seen. You need to form an alliance. But even though Tyrion vouches for him, which I did like, like I trust him, I went to the wall with him. I think the reason why they added that line where Daenerys is like, I'm going to make him bend the knee is because they don't want it to seem too easy. Daenerys is sort of looking at her small council with wary eyes. She's also doing the same thing with Jon Snow. So it's not like they're going to all start hugging on sight and embrace Jon as the secret Targaryen. They still don't know anything about his heritage. Daenerys has barely just learned anything about the White Walkers. So number eight, down in King's Landing, as Tyrion predicts exactly, Cersei takes a very xenophobic approach in trying to turn the Tyrell Bannerman to her side. They're going to come in with their Dothraki hordes, burn, pillage everything, and raise it to the ground. We need to unite against them. So Jaime dangles the idea of becoming Warden of the South in place of the Tyrells once they defeat their army. The really cool thing about this interaction, though, the more fun scene was when Jaime started talking to them because he's like, are you Rickard, Tarly? And all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, triggered again. Another Rickard Stark name drop. Special meaning for Jamie because he was there to witness Rickard burning when the Mad King set him on fire. And then it gets even better because Randall Tarly throws the fact that Jamie's a Kingslayer in his face. The Tarly name means something. We don't stab people in the back, which is the Kingslayer reference, and we don't slit people's throats when we've invited them to dinner for a wedding, which of course is a hat tip for the Red Wedding, which the Lannisters engineered. So they want to show you that he has principles, like he's not a completely evil person. It'll be interesting to see what ends up happening when Samwell finds out that he's fighting for the opposition. Speaking of which, cut to the Citadel. Number seven, we finally get into the Ser Jorah plotline. I love the way the Ebros is reacting to all this. Like, nope, he's incurable. Can't do anything about it. The Archmaester that thought of some secret techniques for curing Grayscale, what happened to him? He died of Grayscale. So there's nothing you can do about it. 
So of course Samwell isn't going to listen to that. He uses the Archmaester's special techniques and basically just cuts the grayscale off and then is going to treat it. It's going to involve some dragon glass treatment. So we haven't quite got to that. They'll follow up with it next week. Like you've done the first part. Now you need to prevent it from coming back in the future. The really extra bits that I loved about these scenes though is that Ebros looks at Jorah's sword, looks at him and says, I'll give you one more night in case there's something you want to do. So he's basically telling Jorah, I'm going to give you time to go out honorably. So before Samwell comes in to cure him, he looks at the sword again as he's writing that letter to Daenerys. Like he's actually contemplating, maybe I go out this way rather than die slowly. But I think, of course, we know that he's going to be cured. It's just going to be incredibly painful. And what about that transition from like the pus in his wound to the man's soup bowl at the end of the crossroads. It's almost like Dan and Dave are trying to be as gross as they can this year. They have the poop montage in episode one. They have the pus montage in episode two. And you may have spotted that one of the books that he was giving to Samwell, because he's giving him all these history books, he's writing a history of Robert's Rebellion. Remember, there's information that we need to know on the show. We need to know what happened between Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. That's probably inside that book. Just a little plot bomb that they planted now that'll explode in a later episode. But of course, number six, Hot Pie is back and explains to Arya what happened in the North during season six. Oh, the Boltons, they're dead. Jon Snow, your brother, he's king of the North. And she immediately almost craps her pants and turns around and goes home. Probably the funniest part in the episode was when he starts going on and on about the night lady. Did she ever find you? And then he starts talking about baking the butter into the pies, which is the same speech that he bored Brienne to death with when he ran into them. The secret is, is that you got to use butter. Not everybody does that. And Arya replies with, I've been baking some pies too. Didn't use butter. Talking about the fray pies that she's been cooking. And we finally get this touching Nymeria reunion. And even though it's bittersweet, I actually think it ends on a hopeful note because Arya recognizes that Nymeria is better off doing what she's doing now, being in the wild. That's not you anymore. Who is a girl? A girl is no one. No, I'm Arya Stark of Winterfell. So Arya is still Arya Stark of Winterfell, but Nymeria is not of Winterfell anymore. But she still recognized Arya and they have that moment. So if they were to run into each other again in the future, she would probably nod to her and then just run off on her way again. But the really cool thing is if they ever choose to bring them back, and I don't know that they will because they're kind of expensive, they could always bring them back in season eight. I'm not expecting Super Pack to come back during season seven is as they are a hardcore weapon. One direwolf by themselves is badass, but a direwolf leading a giant wolf pack is awesome. So number five, this was so awesome. Kyburn takes Cersei down into the crypts beneath the Red Keep and shows her all the Targaryen's dead dragon skulls and explains how they have a weapon to take down Daenerys' dragons. The ancient Targaryens would have had a weapon like that too anyway. So what he did is he just found the research and said, oh, okay, they already have a version of this. So we're going to build a bigger, badder, better version that we're going to use when Daenerys comes marching on us. We just have to acknowledge how awesome Balerion the Black Dread skull is. We haven't been down here since I think season one when Arya was poking around. This was also where she heard Barris and Illyrio plotting to put Daenerys' brother on the throne before he got his golden crown from Khal Drogo, before the events of the rest of the show unfolded. But number four, Daenerys' small council argues about what to do. We learn that they're going to send the Greyjoys south and use the Dornish to attack King's Landing because Tyrion's perfectly predicted how Cersei's going to try and manipulate the realm against them. We don't want to go in with a foreign invading force and we're going to take the true seat of power in Westeros, the Rock. That's where we'll send the Unsullied. So it all seems good, but the problem is, is now they're dividing their army and they've since lost the Greyjoys. And now we know that they have a weapon to fight the dragons. So they're just trying to balance the scales a little bit and show you that Daenerys isn't going to be able to steamroll everyone. And I think part of that has to do with the idea that Jon Snow needs her alliance just as much as she will eventually need it too. Because they lost all their ships, so everybody on both sides, Cersei and Daenerys, will need as much help as they can get. But number three, Jon finally gets the raven from Samwell, so now he's separately 
gotten messages from Daenerys to come to Dragonstone and bend the knee and from Samwell saying that you need to go to Dragonstone because there's Dragonglass there. So there's really nothing else that he can do. And there were a couple weird moments during his big council here where he's trying to explain to them why they need Dragonstone. Like they all love the idea that there's Dragonglass at Dragonstone. Like even as dumb as they might be, they put two and two together. Oh, Dragonglass at Dragonstone. That makes sense. But even the little bear does not want Jon Snow to go to Dragonstone. They reference the Mad King killing Rickard Stark, like I said earlier. They keep likening all these events that are unfolding to events that have happened before, during Robert's Rebellion and back during Aegon's Conquest. But I love Ser Davos' reaction to it all. Dragons. What do dragons have? Fire. Fire is good for fighting White Walkers. She sounds really charming with that horde of hers. But number two, Littlefinger goes to Jon Snow in the crypts while he's looking at Ned Stark, just trying to find the strength to do what he knows he has to do and makes his intentions known for what he's going to be doing with Sansa. I love your sister like I love your mother. I'm the one that brought her your father's bones. And Jon just isn't having any of it. But I love the look that Littlefinger gives Sansa as Jon is riding off for Dragonstone. You can just see the wheels turning in his head like, oh, I have to start moving faster and faster. Because Sansa is sort of wising up to him. Jon Snow doesn't want to have anything to do with him. So the really cool thing we have now is we're building towards an Arya reunion. So hopefully Littlefinger will just go off the deep end, do something super crazy. And you'll have a Stark sister team up versus Littlefinger in the next couple of episodes. But number one, of course, that awesome Greyjoy battle. Big action set piece of the episode. Of course they're going to smash her fleet. They just want to show you how relentless Euron is. And he's actually way more evil in the books. But I love the way they make his ships look so much bigger than Yara's. It literally rams them. Then they board the ship using this giant Kraken weapon. And he starts going at them with his huge axe with the Greyjoy sigil carved into it. So who knows where he found time to make all these fine weapons, but he is armed to the teeth, he has this crazy armor on, and just mows through the Sand Snakes. So if you hated the Sand Snakes, this is probably one of your favorite moments of the episode. But how about that Reek scene at the end? They've been going on and on about how he's becoming more and more like his former self, Theon, again, he's slowly becoming whole, but Euron tries to twist his mind, shake his confidence, and you start to remember the Ramsay sayings from the book, Reek, it rhymes with weak as he jumps overboard. So now, Euron has captured Alaria Sand, Tyene Sand, and Yara Greyjoy in decimated Daenerys' fleet. I don't even think she was able to take down one of Euron's ships. But it was a great action set piece way to end the episode. So I feel like the Greyjoy stuff was a lot stronger in this episode than the Daenerys Jon Snow stuff. Because that's all just still set up for stuff that's happening in future episodes. So the big twist with Daenerys and Jon Snow won't happen until next week in the following episodes. So there are going to be a couple episodes like that where you have storylines where it's just about characters finding information and deciding where to go next before they actually do it in a future episode. So let me know what was your guys' favorite part of the episode and what do you think is going to happen when Daenerys meets with Jon Snow? There's going to be so many jokes because people have been waiting for this to happen in the books for so long. And even though it's going to be different the way that it unfolds in the books, the TV show plot is still written in service to the book plot with minor changes for characters that are dead or alive and in different places. The thing I'm really looking forward to next week, though, is the way they react to the prophecy of the prince or princess who was promised. It just sounds like something that Jon Snow would scoff at. Like, he doesn't really think about prophecy. He's mostly thinking about the army of the dead. And even Daenerys seems very skeptical about it, which I think is actually a pretty natural reaction for the characters. It'd be weird if Melisandre rolled up and they just bought everything she said hook, line, and sinker. So get hype about Davos Melisandre reunion next week. It's going to be great. What's going to happen next is, is I'll post my trailer video for episode 3 and then I'll do a Q&A video on Tuesday just like I did last week. There's a couple more Comic-Con videos that I'm doing, but leave all your bonus video requests in the comments below. Congratulations to the latest giveaway winner, Locum. Please private message me on the back end of my channel so I can get your contact details. While you wait for everything, click here for the latest trailer video that has footage for episode 3 in it and you can click here for all my other Comic-Con videos. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.